So in this video, we're going to talk about pulmonary embolism and we're going to look at the signs and symptoms, the risk factors, the pathophysiology, the investigations, the diagnosis, and then we look at the treatment, the management. So it's a complete uh, video looking at pulmonary embolism. So here I'm drawing a person who has pulmonary embolism. I'm drawing the heart, the lungs, the inferior vena cava, and the descending aorta. The signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolism um, include dyspnea, pleuritic chest pains, tachycardia, hypotension, and signs of deep vein thrombosis, which includes a swollen leg and pain in the legs, the lower legs. And deep vein thrombosis is very important because it's one of the, it's, it's one of the causes of uh, pulmonary embolism. About 95 or 90 percent of pulmonary emboli is a result of uh, a thrombosis that occurs uh, deep in the, from the deep veins. But there are other risk factors that can uh, lead to pulmonary embolism, and these are surgery, such as major abdominal and pelvic surgeries, orthopedic surgeries, obstetrics, such as pregnancy, being pregnant, um, cardiorespiratory uh, problems, such as COPD and congestive heart failure are also risk factors, lower limb problems, such as varicose veins, fractures, malignant diseases, increasing age, immobility, and lastly, thrombotic disorders. So these are the risk factors that can lead to pulmonary embolism or, or pulmonary emboli. Uh, thrombotic disorders is what we will focus on because as I mentioned, 95% of cases of pulmonary embolism is a result of thrombosis from the deep veins. So where do these uh, thrombos, uh, thrombi occur? Well, they occur from uh, mo mainly from the lower limb deep veins, and these include um, you know, common and less common ones. So the common ones are your external iliac vein, your femoral vein, your deep femoral vein, your popliteal vein, your posterior tibial vein. And then the less common sites where thrombi can occur and that can lodge into the lungs are your right-sided uh, from your right side of the heart, uh, gonadal veins, uterine veins, and your great saphenous. So again, these are sources where thrombi can occur and then break off lodging into your pulmonary arteries, causing pulmonary embolism. So what is a thrombus, a thrombi? Well, let's zoom into this, let's just say this external iliac vein. And here I'm drawing the external iliac vein. And thrombi, a thrombus is essentially a collection of red blood cells all clumped together with platelets and fibrin. So here I'm drawing, uh, I'm drawing this to represent a thrombus. So here we have a vein, and this red thing is the thrombus. So that's a representation of a thrombus. And thrombus is caused by a variety of things. Mainly um, cause, the main cause of it uh, is known as virtuose triad, and this essentially is a triad of things that leads to a thrombus formation. Um, so just to recap what a thrombus is, it's essentially, again, you got red blood cells clumping together with platelets, and then you have fibrinogen, which is a clotting factor, which gets converted by thrombin, which is 2A here, into fibrin. And then you get these fibrin, fibrin, fibrin meshwork all like clumping together, causing a thrombus formation. And again, virtuose triad are a triad of things that essentially promotes thrombus formation. And these three things are, one, abnormal blood flow, such as absence of blood flow. Two, hypercoagulability, such as thrombophilia. And three, altered vessel wall abnormal vessel wall. So again, these three things, which make up virtuose triad, promote thrombus formation. Once a thrombus is formed, it has a few fates. We'll talk about five in this video. Thrombus can just resolve, so it can disappear. So resolution is one outcome. The second outcome is propagation. The thrombus can just keep growing along the vein. Three, the thrombus can break off, lodge, forming an emboli, so embolism. A thrombus can also recannulize, essentially having holes in it, changing its structure. And then it can organize, organization. And this essentially means when the thrombus, 
goes within the layers of the vessel wall. In this video, we will mainly focus on embolism, so when the thrombus breaks off. So in this diagram here, you can see an embolus, an emboli, which bro broke off, and it will travel up to the inferior vena cava and then up towards the heart. So here I'm drawing the heart, and here I'm drawing the lungs. So the emboli travels up, it goes into the right atrium, then goes down to the right ventricle, and then it goes up the pulmonary trunk, and it can go either way to the pulmonary arteries. Let's just say it lodges here. So this is a pulmonary emboli. It has lodged into one of the small, smaller branches of the pulmonary artery. We will now look at the pathophysiology. So a pulmonary embolism can lead to, depending how big it is, an increase in pulmonary vascular pressure. An increase in pulmonary vascular pressure causes slight backflow of blood to the right side of the heart. And this will lead to an increase in right ventricular pressure. An increase in right ventricular pressure will dilate the ventricles. It will cause dilation of the right ventricle, which can subsequently lead to right-sided heart failure. When you have right-sided heart failure, it will obviously decrease the stroke volume and decrease the cardiac output, and so logically decrease the blood pressure. And this is on the right side of the heart, remember, but whatever happens on the right side of the heart, it will also affect your left side of the heart. And so, what you get is, from the left side, you get a, also a decrease in cardiac output. So when you have actually a decrease in cardiac output, there will be receptors that will detect this, and that will stimulate the sympathetic response. And the sympathetic response will work to increase heart rate, so you get tachycardia and also cause vasoconstriction, so it will try to increase blood pressure. But it won't work. You will lead, you, um, the result, the net result would be hypotension, because even if you constrict your vessels to increase blood pressure, because you have the pulmonary emboli in the, la, in the pulmonary artery, you will still get a decrease in cardiac output, and so this will have a net decrease in blood pressure, if that makes sense. So that was the effect uh, emboli has on the cardiovascular system. Let's see what effects it has in the lungs during respiration. So here I'm drawing the alveoli. The pulmonary arteries in blue and the pulmonary veins in red. Ventilation is the air moving in and out of the lungs, and that's uh, denoted as V. And then the perfusion is the blood flow to and out of the lungs. So this is your Q. And here is our emboli, let's just say. Now because the emboli lodges here, it causes two main things. Firstly, it causes inflammation. Second, it causes VQ mismatch. So ventilation, perfusion, mismatch. So a pulmonary emboli causes abnormal gas exchange. So pulmonary embolism leads to an obstruction, which leads to VQ mismatch and inflammation. Inflammation results in a lot of cytokines being released, which will lead to bronchoconstriction. Bronchoconstriction, which will de decreases the oxygen coming in. And because of this, the decrease in oxygen will stimulate hyperventilation, so you're breathing rapidly which will lead to hypocapnia, a decrease in carbon dioxide. So the VQ mismatch and inflammation both contribute to hypoxemia and hypocapnia, which leads to respiratory alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis is what we can find when we do an ABG test, an arterial blood gas test. I hope that made sense. So a person presenting with pulmonary, emboli uh, pulmonary embolism, um, like symptoms, um, may come in. But how do you know it's pulmonary embolism? And how do you rule out other differentials? Well, investigation can be performed, which is what we will look at next. So investigations. We can do an x-ray. Now, x-ray is very important for any respiratory problems. 
but x-rays usually come back normal for pulmonary embolism. And x-rays are used to exclude other differentials such as pneumonia and pneumothorax. But you can find some common features in pulmonary embolism, in PE. So here, let's just draw this x-ray uh, image out. Here of the lungs, the mediastinum, the heart. So one thing you can see is that you can potentially see an enlarged pulmonary artery because of pulmonary vascular high, uh, increase in pressure. Two, you can see a wedged, wedged shape, shaped opacity, which is somewhat like a consolidation, but it's due to infarction of that area. There's no blood supply to that area due to the emboli. Three, you can see an elevated hemidiaphragm. And four, you can see a pleuritic uh, effusion. The second investigation you can do, which should be done, is ECG. This also usually comes back normal, but it's used to exclude myocardial infarction and pericarditis. But you do find some common findings in PE, in pulmonary embolism. So let's have a look. Um, so here I'm drawing an ECG sort of image strip, but we're only looking at just the main ones. So in lead two, let's just look at what a normal uh, ECG looks like. We have this, it looks like this. We have the PQRST wave, and between the RR interval is your rate. And the rhythm should be normal, right? Well, in PE, you can see sinus tachycardia in about 50% of cases, and this is essentially when your rate uh, increases, so your RR interval shortens. And this you can see in lead two. Another thing you can see in PE, in about 35% of cases, is right ventricular strain. And right ventricular strain can be seen in leads V1 to V4. And essentially, if we draw it out, what you see is that the T wave is inverted. Of course, in, in the ECG, this doesn't actually look like this, the actual uh, PQRS T wave, but the T wave is inverted for right ventricular strain. Another thing you can see in ECG is what's known as S1Q3T3, and you're essentially looking at leads 1 and leads 3. And what you're seeing is that you're seeing deep, deep versions of this wave in that lead. So for example, for lead 1, you see a deep S wave. So the S wave is deeper than usual. In leads 3, you see a deep Q wave and you see a deep T wave. I hope that made sense. Other investigations that can be performed is your CT pulmonary angiogram, which is a gold standard for, uh, for finding out if the person has PE. You, also have, you can also do a VQ perfusion scanning test, which is used. What I mean by not really used is that people, um, it's, it's, it's not definite using that. You usually use a CT pulmonary angiogram. Um, five, you can do a bedside echocardiogram. And six, you can do a D-dimer essay, which we will look into in more detail um, next, soon. Okay, so diagnosing or the clinical signs of PE is very difficult to differentiate from other uh, differentials. So what's important when, when trying to see if a person has PE, it's important to look at their risk factors.